So good afternoon. I'm John Loris, director of NIGMS, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the DeWitt Stetton Jr. Lecture. Before I introduce our speaker today, I want to tell you a little bit about the distinguished scientist for whom this lecture is named. Dr. Stetton spent most of his career at NIH, uh, including serving in two institutes and the office of the director. He was perhaps best known as NIH Deputy Director for Science, but before that, he actually served as the third director of NIGMS. In recognition of his many contributions uh, to NIH and the scientific community as a whole, Dr. Stetton had the rare distinction of having two NIH entities named after him. This lecture is one of those, and the other is the DeWitt Stetton Jr. Museum of Medical Research, which was dedicated during NIH's centennial in 1987. Dr. Stetton passed away in 1990, but we honor his legacy every year with this lecture, the only exception actually being last year when Ron Vail was supposed to speak, um, but the government shutdown prevented the lecture from taking place. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce Ron Vail, who will talk to us about his pioneering studies of cytoskeletal motor proteins. Ron's scientific journey began in 1983 when, as an MD-PhD student at Stanford, he went to the Woods Hole Laboratories in Massachusetts uh, to do work with M Michael Sheets studying vesicle transport um, in nerve fibers, specifically using squid giant axons for this work. And I was disappointed to learn that squid giant axons are different than giant squid axons which I thought would be a really impressive model system for Ron to have been using. Nonetheless, their work led to the discovery of molecular, the molecular motor kinesin, which in turn led to a decision by Ron to forgo the rest of his medical training and instead to pursue what he has called the grand adventure of basic research. After receiving his PhD in neuroscience in 1985 and doing a year of postdoctoral research at MBL, and no, one year as a postdoc, so times were very different back then, Ron was offered a job at the University of California, San Francisco, where he's now a professor and vice chair of cellular and molecular pharmacology. And I actually was having dinner fairly recently with Henry Bourne, who was until fairly recently the chair of that department. And I, during the course of our dinner, asked Henry what his uh, most proud achievements were from the, his time as chair of the department. And the very first thing he said to me was, well, I hired Ron Vail. So as you will hear, Ron's lab went on from the discovery of kinesin to elucidate in astounding detail how it functions at a molecular level and at a cellular level, work that he will tell us about today. But in addition to his amazing scientific achievements, one of the things that impresses me the most about Ron is his contributions uh, to science as a scientific citizen, a truly extraordinary scientific citizen. For example, he founded the highly regarded online lecture site, iBiology, which if you haven't seen, I encourage you to go to and look at, which has become an important forum for new ideas in biomedical research and education. He's also an exemplary mentor of trainees, both in the U.S. and abroad, and abroad in particular in India, where he has started a variety of training and mentoring programs. Ron served as the president of the American Society for Cell Biology in 2012, and I'm told that it was he who recruited Stefano Bertuzzi as executive director of ASCB. Among his many honors are the Albert Lasker Basic Medical Research Award and the Wiley Prize in Biomedical Sciences. And in fact, just last week he was elected to the Institute of Medicine, and even more hot off the press, he is on his way immediately after this lecture to Heidelberg, Germany, where he will be inducted uh, into EMBO, uh, the European Molecular Biology Organization. I'm proud to say that NIGMS has supported Ron's research since 1988, and more recently we began funding iBiology.org as well. So without any further ado, I'll turn the podium over to Ron and hear his amazing studies.
Well, it's an enormous honor to come here and uh, give this talk. Uh, you know, essentially, I owe my entire scientific career really to the NIH. Uh, what John uh, did mention is actually all the work on Kinesin was performed in a NIH-sponsored lab of Tom Reese at the Marine Biological Lab at Woods Hole. And my one year as a postdoc was really as a staff scientist uh, uh, with the NIH at Woods Hole. So that was the start of my career. And really, uh, ever since then, my research work has been um, supported by NIH. I, I guess it was really the wonderful days where, uh, you know, you submit your first uh, R01, and I was uh, supported uh, from that moment on, on really all the work that we've done on molecular motors. Um, so, I indeed, my entire career, uh, you know, I, I owe to the NIH, which is really kind of the model of the world of uh, uh, how to do um, uh, high-impact science and how to make discoveries that move science forward and also uh, influence uh, medicine around the world. I do want to also say that, uh, you know, I love science, uh, but as you've heard, I think it's really important, especially for senior scientists, to take a very uh, active role in building uh, our scientific community. And it's really essential that, you know, science is not just people uh, going into the lab and pipetting, but it's really about creating networks of people that um, allow us uh, to do the best possible research. And I've had a few projects that really just started off as very grassroots idea, some which came out of um, lab retreats, and uh, then through help with NIH led to what I think have become very uh, influential international projects. So I just, before I get into the science, I do want to highlight some of these. So one project that has received NIH support is to build open source software for microscopy. And uh, the old days of microscopy where you looked through the eyepiece of the microscope are, are long gone. Uh, now all microscopes really work by acquiring images on cameras. And the microscopes themselves are complicated uh, instruments with a lot of robotics that control stages and filters and uh, other parts of the equipment. And all of that uh, equipment and instrumentation has to be orchestrated by computer software that uh, basically um, lays out the game plan of how the experiment is performed on the microscope and how the data is collected. Um, and we saw a big need uh, to develop open source software, uh, which is completely free. Uh, and I encourage those of you in the audience to try it. Uh, and this has been supported by the NIH. And um, so the essential, and this is actually the brainchild of this, Nico Sturman, kind of hesitate to show this photograph in Washington right now. Um, but this is both of us at a recent Giants game. Um, but, and this is the micromanager team here. And the key components of this software are very simple, but e extremely, I think, important in the landscape of promoting my, my, microscopy-based research. So first of all, it's the only open source software for controlling microscopes. That means any research can, researcher can gain access to the code and modify it in ways that allow them to execute a particular experiment. The second thing is it's free. So this is, uh, you know, a huge bonus. And honestly, I think we've saved NIH investigators uh, and the NIH millions of dollars uh, through the development of this software. Uh, neither of these features are, are true of commercial software. But the other uh, big reason for doing this project is that it's uh, the one s software platform that allows you potentially to control any kind of instrument in association with a microscope, as opposed to a lot of commercial software there, where there's a limited scope of equipment that is supported by that commercial software. And 
it's very difficult to develop uh, adapters to uh, develop new instrumentation. And this is essential, I think, for doing leading edge research with microscopy, where you may want to build your own custom piece of equipment and integrate equipment from different vendors to uh, develop the microscope system that you want to develop uh, to tackle a particular research problem. And these are all the instru instruments controlled by Micromanager. In black are code that we write, but in um, red are vendors that contribute code, actually, because they see this as valuable. In blue are code com contributed by um, uh, just outside individual investigators. So it really has become a community project. And uh, you know, this just, and I, the uh, funding for, uh, with NIH started right here, and you can just see the growth of our users for this software, citations, and more recently we we're, were tracking systems, like microscope systems that are coming online. So I, I'm very proud of this. I'm very uh, proud to have NIH support for this, and I'm, I'm very glad that it's had this big, uh, big impact in um, this field, which I love, which is microscopy. The, the second area that, again, uh, started off really as a grassroots idea with a preliminary $2,000 pilot grant was um, this project, iBiology, funded by NIGMS and NSF. Um, and the broad uh, scope of this project, uh, maybe I could start with this, which you can relate to. I think everyone in this room realizes it's critical to allow uh, scientific literature to be freely accessible and easily accessible by uh, researchers in the United States and around the world. And you know, PubMed and the whole concept of moving towards open access uh, to scientific literature has been an enormous game changer in the world of written communication of science. But all of you are in the room here because you find it valuable to listen to a scientist present their work in an oral format. And indeed, this has been an age-old mechanism for the way we both communicate science and also really understand scientific research and the whole scientific process. That's why we go to seminars. That's why we go to uh, meetings. But keep in mind that there are institutions like the NIH, like UCSF, like other elite institutions that have funding for uh, seminar programs. And I think there is a real, uh, actually a moral imperative that uh, the entire world, just like literature, has a chance to listen to scientists communicate their work in oral visual format. And because of this moral, I would say, you know, a critical imperative, you know, we started this project, iBiology, again, to make research ideas, opinions of leading biologists freely available. Um, this is uh, funded by NSF and NIH, supported by ASCB. It's had a lot of support by HHMI uh, in the early days. And we film scientists in a studio environment, and basically uh, these kind of high-quality talks that we produce end up on a website, uh, which you can see here, which I encourage you to go to. But um, basically, what you'll find here is um, uh, a lot of seminars from, uh, these are full-length seminars with a broader introduction uh, onto the topic. We have short 15-minute talks on issues related to, these are, I almost like to think of as like the TED Talks of our profession on discoveries, careers, opinions. And we also have a whole suite of talks uh, re related to uh, education. And, uh, you know, what's been also very encouraging is we've really been able to mobilize the best people in the scientific profession to participate on it in this project. And you'll see talks from very well-recognized scientists in this series. There's also potentially very large impact for education. So this is a new project we launched in 2013 with selected videos that uh, can be applied to uh, university or graduate level education. We produced our first courses. We have one on uh, light microscopy, actually, other on scientific teaching, uh, short video clips that can be used in classrooms, also starting 
to produce new talks designed more for high school and college. And about 50% uh, of this material is right now being used in, of, in, at the college level. And also, uh, this is the user uh, growth for this. This is where uh, NSF, NIH funding started. But um, we're right now up to about uh, close to 2 million views per year, and the project is uh, getting wider and wider recognition and attention and dissemination in our life science community. So, you know, I think the exciting part of this is us as scientists who love what we do as scientists, who love our profession, who want to communicate the excitement of our profession, who, you know, want to describe the beauty and the process of, of how we do science, not just didactic facts, but really the process uh, that's inherently beautiful about um, research discovery, that, you know, this can be an engine for, for communicating this, and to involve all scientists in our community in this process. Okay, so on to science. What I'm going to talk to you today is uh, about motion. Um, and again, the wonderful thing about this subject is everyone understands that living organisms can move. You can ask uh, a kindergarten uh, student that. They appreciate this as one of the fundamental at attributes of life, such as this uh, movement of a large organism, or when you look under a microscope at pond water, you can see lots of organisms swimming about, each with their own kind of motility. Uh, the concept of motion uh, takes another and even more exciting form in many ways when you look inside of virtually any cell. Uh, when you peer in with a proper microscope, and this is a, um, a, a giant axon from a medium-sized squid, um, but you can see that the whole interior of this axon is teeming with vesicles moving up and down this axon. And we know this is true for any cell. Any cell you look at in the microscope has, uh, is moving components around in a purposeful way to different places of the cell. And um, the beautiful process of uh, division, uh, this just shows chromosomes in green, microtubules in red, the chromosomes align in this fly embryo, and then the chromosomes physically separate. All of that orchestrated motion of building the spindle and moving chromosomes is another example of biological motility. I mean, what we're discovering is that motion is almost essential for everything that we uh, look at in biological systems. And to carry out this myriad of motor-driven processes, humans, for example, employ a number of different kinds of molecular motors that fit in these categories. One are the actin-based myosin motors, which has a long history of great research uh, at NIH. Um, then there are the microtubule-based motors, one class called kinesins, which I'll start on later. I'll talk about dynines. And the reason why there's so many is that the cell has so many jobs in terms of motility, it deploys these different motors for different motility jobs in the cell. And these motors are also uh, mutated in various kinds of human disease, and I think there's also opportunities to manipulate these motors to treat disease as well. And I'll just give you one example, and I will mention uh, this is from a company that I co-founded called Cyto Cytokinetics, and I am on the SAB for that company. I do hold stock in that company. But I, I want to show you really what I think is a, a pretty amazing result, which this is a patient uh, who has a failing heart, so heart failure. And basically, this, this is the atrium and ventricle, and they're not really uh, contracting properly and vigorously enough to, uh, for the heart to function properly for its job in blood flow. And you can see this fluttering um, uh, valve here as an indication of improper contraction and turbulent flow. And this is a drug that activates specifically the cardiac myosin that is driving the contractility of the heart. Um, it doesn't touch any of these other motors. It just touches the one myosin involved in cardiac contraction and after this patient is taking this drug called omocamptive, you can see uh, the heart recovers much uh, uh, proper uh, contractility 
Um, and this is being now tested for treatment in heart failure in phase two trials. Also a very brave strategy because the company decided they were going to look for a drug that would actually make uh, the motor work better than uh, normal motor. Most drugs actually inhibit targets. This one actually activates the myosin motor. So just in general, I think there are many medical opportunities here for uh, manipulating these uh, motors in disease. So what I would, though, like to talk about um, is kind of the basic uh, biochemistry uh, and structural biology of how these molecular motors work. I would say, let me point out, the development of that drug that I showed you required a basis of years of uh, basic research to even make uh, the initiation of that drug discovery process possible. That was done by knowing uh, the enzymology and the biochemistry of that motor through many investigators so that one could actually design very clear enzymatic readouts that would allow one to find the one drug out of half a million or a million that would produce this particular effect. Would not have been possible without actually knowing the enzymology and biochemistry of that particular protein. So what do motor proteins do? Well, they are enzymes. And what they do is they take chemical energy and convert it into motion. And they do so by taking this chemical energy source, which is ATP, hydrolyzing it, and then going through a sequence of chemical events where they first release the phosphate, then they release the ADP, and then they start this cycle again. And during these transitions in the chemical cycle, uh, this is being uh, leading to changes in the motor protein structure that leads to force and motion. The motors do so with an uncanny efficiency that would be the envy of uh, Detroit. Um, uh, it produces about four, 50 to 90 percent efficiency. So, indeed, even when we think about making small man-made machines, we have a lot to learn about how nature has built its own machines. But this is an example of motility, where uh, this is actually um, work done in that NIH lab at Woods Hole in 1984, where you can see um, uh, a plastic bead here being coated with this motor protein kinesin, and these beads being transported along the microtubules. So this cycle is being converted into that motion. OK. so. Um, well, we'd like to know more than that, and we'd like to actually understand how the protein does this. Um, you know, this is a protein that has a particular structure, and we would like to understand what's happening in that protein molecule when it's undergoing this movement generating process. Honestly, um, you know, in many ways, when I was, as a slight digression, when I was working on this problem as a graduate student and then a staff scientist with NIH, it was hard for me to imagine that we would actually understand the answer to how something that small, something that's 10 nanometers, a millionth of an inch, really works. It was kind of a dream that, you know, I didn't even know whether I could answer it in our lifetime. And what you never know in sciences is how many different kinds of new discoveries and new tools and new approaches come on board that can allow you to answer that qu question much more quickly than you can even dream about. And indeed, what became like, maybe I'll never answer this in a lifetime, actually converted into reality in maybe about 15 years to work in our lab and others. But let me frame this in a conceptual way that uh, this actually shows an old um, uh, high-speed photograph to answer a basic question of how a horse gallops. This was sponsored by Stanford, uh, Leland Stanford, using new technology to answer a question whether the horse ever galloped with all of its legs off of the ground or whether there always had to be an intermediate state with one leg attached. And with this new technology, they could answer the question. And what we're trying to do is something very similar to this. We want to get snapshots of this protein as it's undergoing this cycle to understand the mechanics of how it leads to motion. OK, so I'm just summarizing a lot of uh, you know, 
decades of work done by hundreds of investigators summarizing how we think these motors work. First, the myosin motor, uh, which drives skeletal, cardiac, contraction, cytokinesis, other, many other events as well. Um, but this is an animation, but based upon a, a lot of research where you can, um, oh, I think I need to click on it. You can see uh, this motor here bind. It's now releasing a hydrolyzed ATP. It releases the phosphate. That phosphate release causes a large structural movement of this big portion of the protein, which you call a lever arm. ATP comes in, it dissociates it, it recocks now and can start another cycle. So the motor binds, it strokes, it forces the actin filament to move by about 10 nanometers and it recocks. And maybe as Carl Sagan would say, it's billions and billions of these events that cause cumulatively your muscle to contract. Uh, for kinesin, we also have a good idea of how it works. Um, uh, slightly different, it uses its two heads to kind of crawl in a hand-over-hand -hand manner where ATP binds. It causes a structural change in this small little piece of the protein. Um, and this little piece, which we call the neck linker, zippers up along the side of the blue portion of the protein. And this little arm effectively causes its partner motor domain to move, for, move from a backward site to a forward site along the microtubule, a little bit like a judo expert with a flip of an arm might throw an opponent from a rear side to a forward site. And it, it does this over and over again as it crawls down uh, the axon of a nerve cell. Well, like many things in biology, there always are terrifically unexpected results that change your concept of how things work. And one of the big game changers, I, I think, for us and maybe even for both fields, uh, is that both of these two proteins are related to one another evolutionarily. And in fact, they have very similar strategies of how they produce motion. Previously, the kinesin field and the myosin field, in many ways, didn't talk to one another. They had separate meetings because they thought these proteins were completely different. Naturally, this one's much smaller. It works on microtubules. This one works on actin. But this is a little summary of what we learned um, and also you know, kind of the beauty and the modularity of evolution. So uh, both these proteins are structurally similar. They clearly came from a common ancestor, which is actually related to G proteins. And the common piece is this blue core. This is the ancient part of the motor. It's what does the chemistry. And it does a little more than just the chemistry. It actually contains a chemical sensor that can tell the difference whether there's ADP or ATP in the active site. Um, it then has another common element, which is an information transducer. It's a long helix you can see in green. One end of that helix is talking to the nucleotide and changing its conformation. The other end is talking to a mechanical element. I showed you the two different mechanical elements for kinesin and myosin. They are indeed different. But the strategy is this little green helix talks to these mechanical elements to change their state. So that's the green helix there. These are the mechanical elements. So what we could then begin to realize by looking at these two things, a common commonality of a general strategy of how these proteins produce motion. OK, so now with that general background on how motors work, let's fast forward to 2014. And I'd like to tell you about uh, our very recent work on dynein motility. So we made kind of a strategic uh, decision to move away from kinesin and onto dynein probably about 10 years ago. I still have one student in the lab working on kinesin. But the reason is we were beginning to understand kinesin much better. And I think it's always important to take on new challenges and enter arenas that are less well understood. So at that time, clearly dynein was the frontier uh, of molecular motors. Very little known about how it works. I'll describe a little more later why dynein was such a challenge. But, well, this, this slide describes it pretty well. It's massive. It's uh, the entire uh, dynein motor protein. These are the motor domains. These are chains that 
interact with cargo, but it's about one and a half megadaltons. So uh, this is really one of the largest uh, polypeptide chains and largest protein complexes in the cell. Uh, but it's incredibly important for so much biology. It's what drives ciliary beating or the beating of sperm, of the cilia in your trachea, organisms in pond water. It also transports in mammalian cells virtually all types of cargo from the plus end of microtubules, which is at the periphery towards the center. Most kinesins move in the opposite direction. So dynein counterbalances kinesin in cargo transport for proteins, for RNAs, for organelles, viruses. Um, it also is involved in building the mitotic spindle and in kinetochore function and checkpoints that are involved in the cell's decision about whether it wants to undergo division or not. So the amount of biology that this protein family is involved in is, is you know, just enormous. And this is just a subset that I described. So it was important protein to understand. So we got into the game uh, through, first of all, a very brave postdoc who tried to tackle this project, Samrak Peterson, who started uh, our lab using Cerevisiae as a model system to produce dynein and also develop motility assays. Um, this is a single molecule motility assay that she developed, microtubules in blue, and each of these spots is a single dynein molecule from yeast that's labeled, and you can see it being transported beautifully along these microtubules. So the, this is an example of processive movement, that these molecules move once they bind for long distances along the track. This was a really hard problem, and there are several postdocs that had to work together in the early days to develop different parts of the system. Um, Ahmet was a physicist, developed high-resolution tracking methods so we can understand dynein stepping. Arna developed optical trap studies. Andrew was a gifted uh, crystal, is a gifted crystallographer, did some of our uh, work setting up uh, structure work on dynein that I'll tell you about more later. The point is, like all of these postdocs had to work together in the initial days, uh, which is often a challenge right now in, uh, in laboratories. And you kind of have to promise that sometimes you, you do have to work together to overcome things that are difficult, but people will do fine in the end. Anyway, all of these individuals actually did really fine, and they're in great labs, and they're actually producing stellar work right now. So they're all fantastic independent investigators in their own right. Okay, now let's move on to more recent times and a second generation of postdoc, Rick McKenney. So we were involved with yeast for many years. We decided we should tackle mammalian dynein and understand its motility. So that's what Rick took on for his postdoc. Well, Rick made a recombinant human dynein. He also purified rat dynein. And when he did single molecule motility studies, the results did not look anywhere, anything like what I just showed you for yeast dining. Uh, maybe you can't see it that well, but there are a lot of spots here. They're, these are individual human dynings. They're stuck onto microtubules. And basically, they're not moving. And this is just a quantitative way of looking at it, where you can follow one spot along a linear microtubule over time. It's called a chymograph. And if it is in the same spot, it just maintains a straight line. If it's moving over time, you can see the slanted line. And most things were either not moving or moving at incredibly slow speeds that we, we knew were not true of dynein transport. Bottom line, Rick's postdoc was not off to a great start. <laughs> and you know, he tried over and over again to get this to work. And, you know, it's one of those moments, that uh, deciding moments, where you're really trying to think of what to do. You know, a, you know, is this an artifact? Did you not purify the protein right? Is there something wrong with your assay or your buffer or the way you treated it? Or is there something missing in your logic? And is there some, something that you didn't really think through in terms of the biology of how it works? I mean, this is the real-life battle that students and postdocs face all the time in the lab. Um, and, you know, there are critical decisions here to make. Well, uh, 
unfortunately, uh, Rick, uh, brilliant postdoc, decided to take the other route and maybe look for opportunities that, uh, or things that were missing that maybe explained why mammalian dining did not move like yeast dining. And one thing that we knew is that dining has a partner in cells. Uh, of course, it needs a partner of similar size, I have no idea why, but it has chosen as its uh, mate a very large protein complex called dynactin, which is also over a million uh, Daltons. And it's known that if you knock out dynein, dynactin, you get often a very similar phenotype to a dynein knockdown. The exact reason, not completely clear, it's been thought that maybe dy dynactin helps the motility, maybe it's docks dynein onto cargo, but um, not completely clear. Some other hints are, there are some other proteins that have been implicated in attaching dynein to cargo, one of which actually came out of the original Nusslin Volhart and Eric Vischhaus fly screen called Big D. And it was subsequently known by many labs to have some role in dining motility and in docking dining to cargo. It's a, it's a small protein of a coil coil. Now, now I was talking to John about this. You know, we were thinking about how dining, dynactin, and so forth, well, how this might all fit together. And there was a paper that came out at the time that uh, described that you can make a biochemically tight complex uh, with dining, dynactin, and Big D, that the three of them came together in a stable uh, biochemical uh, complex. And because of that, we were beginning to think, well, maybe this is the secret sauce for motility. So Rick took up that challenge. Uh, purified that complex now with actually a GFP tag on this big D, purified it. We can see it by EM here. Here you can see the two motor domain rings of dynein. This is actually an amazing little structure. It's a short actin filament of a defined length. So the structure here, I mean, we can't see all really the details right now of how the pieces are fit in, but this is what the complex looks like. And voila. Uh, Rick's um, postdoc suddenly in one day started looking much better uh, when he uh, went to the microscope and got this result that uh, he saw this fantastic movement, movement of dining as part of this dining dynact and big D super complex. And now these chymographs show these long, long uh, diagonal runs which are indicative of very precessive movement if we quantitate them these molecules are moving actually much better than kinesin um, in terms of length of travel and, and far greater than any movement that we've even seen with yeast dining. So we've got this ultra-processive movement. Um, and actually, I should say that independently, Andrew Carter, former postdoc, through the same kind of logic of reading the literature, actually um, ended up publishing a very similar to the result that I'm showing you here. So um, we then, this was very exciting, but then we, we then wanted to know, is this just a peculiarity of the, the, this big D, or is this telling us something more general about how dining is regulated in cells? Um, and what we knew about big D is that it's an adapter protein, that it not only binds to uh, dynactin and possibly dining, but it also binds to proteins that are docked onto vesicular cargo. So it was known to bind to a Rab protein, which is a GTPase, only in the GTP form. And this Rab is found on um, specific cargoes and cells, mainly the Golgi. So we wondered, is this a general mechanism whereby adapters link dynein onto different cargo and also in the process of linking onto the cargo, potentially activate it. So in the literature, there are other kinds of coil coil proteins, which I'm listing here, that also attach dining onto recycling endosomes, early endosomes, and the kinetochore. So uh, Walter, who I did show you before, is a graduate student in the lab, made these, uh, these proteins to test that idea. And again, beautifully, uh, the result worked the same. All of these other adapter proteins uh, form tight dining-dynactin complexes 
and induce this uh, very nice ultra-processive movement. So what is the mechanism of this movement? Well, honestly, I'm going to tell you, a, we don't fully understand it, so I'm just going to give you a, a little progress report that is no doubt incomplete and uh, will no doubt change in, in, in a year or two. But the question that uh, came up immediately is whether microtubule binding by this dynactin complex may play a role in the processive mechanism. So we obviously dynein binds to microtubules. It does that by this long stalk and this little microtubule binding domain. But dynactin has a similar antenna and a microtubule binding domain on its end. And that's been previously characterized. So we wanted to know if that microtubule binding domain is involved in movement. Um, so as a first approach to this problem, what we wanted to do is, in the previous movie I showed you, we were, we were just following one of the components. We labeled, for example, Big D with GFP, but we weren't seeing dynein or dynactin. So now we wanted to look at, with different colored labels, dynein with a green GFP label, and using different fluorescent labels, a blue tag on Big D, a red tag on dynactin, we wanted to see the behavior of each of these components um, and follow them by microscopy. So um, as a start, you know, we can now combine them in different combinations and ask also how they bind to microtubules. So here we are combining dynein and dynactin uh, without Big D. And this is our same chymograph. So, you know, a line here indicates something is bound to a microtubule. In this case, it's not moving because there's no diag diagonal lines. But di dynein is binding but not moving. Interestingly, dynactin is not even bound. And this was an unexpected result because if you chop off that big antenna that I showed you, it binds to microtubules great, but in the context of the whole complex, it doesn't. So we think actually dynactin is auto-inhibited by a mechanism we, have, we don't understand right now. But when we add Big D, now everything is co-localizing and everything is moving in together on the microtubule. And I can just show you this from this movie where there's a green, blue, and red, uh, each of these components. They're separated in space because the camera is taking a green snapshot, a blue snapshot, a red snapshot, and while it's taking the different snapshots, dynein isn't waiting, posing for the camera. It's actually moving along the microtubule. So uh, um, that's what you can see here, the green, the red, uh, uh, moving together as uh, a single complex along the microtubule track. So that gave us some insight into dynactin regulation. It still didn't answer the question of whether dynactin needs to bind to the microtubule. It might activate dynein by another mechanism. So here's a little tool or trick we use to investigate this problem. And that is microtubules are interesting. Everyone draws it in the textbook as this big cylinder. But in fact, there's the globular part, but there's a disordered C-terminal tail um, from tubulin, which is unstructured, and that's why it's never shown in the textbooks. But um, uh, you can cleave off that, that, that C-terminal unstructured peptide with subtle lysin and create two different kind of microtubule tracks. So why is this interesting? Well, we know dynein binds to both of these kind of microtubule substrates equally well, but dynactin doesn't. It binds to the tubulin that have these tail components, but not at all to the cleaved microtubule tracks. So the question is, when we're looking at this three-part complex, what was the behavior of this complex? Obviously, we knew it worked with normal microtubules, but with these cleaved microtubules, would it show the dynein signature, or did it really require a dynactin component as well? So it's rare that you get such clear results, but these are the cleaved microtubules in blue, the red microtubules in red, and they are actually sitting right next to one another on the same cover slip. And the dynein is moving great gangbusters on these microtubules with the tails, but essentially not even touching these microtubules that have the cleaved C terminus. So we think that something um, involved in dynactin interaction with the microtubule tract, specifically with the tail, is involved in the mechanism. 
Okay, so big picture, here is the summary, the working model, and it's very much work in progress, but we think that you know, normal dynein in uh, mammalian cells is not like yeast. It actually is probably um, inhibited from undergoing lo long processive motion, and it has to be activated, and the way it's activated is in concert with docking the dynein onto its proper cargo. So it does that by harnessing an adapter protein that brings uh, dynein to a proper receptor so it transports the right kind of cargo. And it also hooks onto this ride, this dynactin complex, which converts the dynein now into this highly processive molecule only when it's coupled with its correct cargo. So, you know, of course, this is really just the start of a whole bunch of other questions that we like to know about this regulatory mechanism. But I think we moved from, uh, you know, a disappointing result of not getting dynein to work at all to actually a whole new direction in the lab that we didn't anticipate at the very start of these studies, which turned out to be much more exciting than, in reality, the original experiments that we proposed. Let me now uh, come back um, to this problem of understanding more, I would say, the detailed structural mechanism of how dynein works. Uh, specifically, when it goes through this chemical cycle, what are the sequence of events that are happening in the dynein motor domain to cause it to move? And I, I can finish this in five minutes, but, uh, or I will have to finish in five minutes. Um, let me just say, for those of you that are saying, well, you understand kinesin, it's another microtubule motor. Not true. Uh, actually, kinesin and myosin have a lot in common, but dynein comes from a completely different protein family called AAA ATPases that have more in common with protein unfoldases than with kinesin. And these are, for example, unfoldases that stuff polypeptides into degradative chambers like the proteasome. So the point is, um, you know, we cannot rely on what we know about kinesin to solve this problem. Now, the way these AAA proteins work in most cases is there's a domain, a subunit, that's encoded by one gene, and these AAA proteins homohexamerize into a functional ring. And in most cases, the substrate, like the polypeptide, goes through the ring. They also work as a group because one subunit stimulates the ATP hydrolysis of the neighbor. Now, dynein is a weird uncle in this family because it's taken uh, and concatenized into a single polypeptide chain six different AAA domains, all in one polypeptide, uh, four of which can bind ATP, two of them which don't, and two domains here seem rather important for motility. This gives you an idea of kind of the state of the problem. This is what kinesin looks like, which we thought it looked pretty big a long time ago. But this is the size of dynein, which is dwarfs kinesin. Um, now, how does the dynein molecule work? Where there, there's this big appendage that goes over the ring. Beautiful work by Burgess, Roberts, and others has suggested that this big uh, helical domain or big piece of dynein may work like a lever arm, like myosin, and swing between different states to produce a power stroke. But, you know, this is one of the most amazing uh, creations of also protein communication that I know of. And I'll just illustrate and highlight the problem that the main ATPA site is way up here. And it has to communicate to this mechanical element mainly at this part here to change its structure, so all the way across the ring. It also has to communicate all the way down this long coil-coil extension to the microtubial binding domain because it has to instruct it when that microtubule binding domain has to let go of the microtubule so it can take a step and move, and when it should hold on tightly to the microtubule track. So it's just a fascinating question of how all this works. And the other question is, dynein also has this second domain, which kinesin or myosin doesn't have, that somehow regulates motility. So uh, I don't have very much time, but the sequence of events was, you know, we now needed to move dynein into the structural age of which Andrew Carter uh, got that first key critical uh, uh, x-ray structure of dynein where we got the domain organization. 
And that key structure showed something very surprising, that dynein, unlike a lot of AAA proteins, is very asymmetric. And in fact, it has big gaps in the ring in also really unexpected places. For example, this is the major ATPA site, and I told you that AAA ATPases work by the two neighboring sites coming closer together. So it just seemed like this, there was no way this was ever going to hydrolyze ATP. So we speculated in our earlier model that this was a nucleotide free state, but when ATP binds in here, this domain will close like a clamshell, and this other open domain will also close like a clamshell, and this is part of the conformational change strategy. So, you know, the game, just like I showed you for the horse, is to get multiple snapshots. Also, I should add that uh, the, um, the, the cone group in Japan also got a, a very influential ADP structure of dictostelium dynein. But these two here, uh, in addition to our earlier APO structure, got a crystal structure in, with a non-hydrolyzable nucleotide. Also a beautiful example of coupling X-ray and EM. They got other states, not quite as high resolution, but where we could fit secondary structure in other kinds of nucleotide states to get other snapshots of dynein. Uh, also a beautiful example of two people working uh, together in a wonderfully cooperative way in the lab. And this just shows the structural changes that we think happen. When ATP binds, this whole side of the ring lifts up. Uh, then this domain uh, swings over to this side, and uh, that's the pre-power stroke, and, at, and then it swings back for the post-power stroke. That is a movie that we piece together from these different nucleotide states. So it, it did show us that several elements of this model were in fact right, and we learned some new information as well. But in the last one minute, we did uncover also some, something unexpected and surprising about this other AAA domain, AAA3, which we never, most people never knew how to incorporate in any model or mechanism. What we found is when, and I'm just summarizing results, when AAA3 is in an ADP state, i.e. it's hydrolyzed nucleotide state, we get that conformational change of the linker. But when ATP is bound, and that conformational change can propagate around the entire ring to cause that conformational change of this lever. When AAA3 does not hydrolyze the nucleotide, has a non-hydrolyzable analog, when ATP binds here, that conformational change whips around, but it stops right at AAA3, and it prevents the conformational change from going around the rest of the ring and changing the state of the linker. So it blocks that. So we think it's a gating mechanism that blocks the conformational change strategy, just like if you start off a domino effect, uh, that's, you know, with these AAA1, it goes from one domain to the other, but AAA3 is almost like putting a finger on that one domino that prevents it from going forward. And what we think, and honestly we don't know, is that this smells like a new regulatory mechanism for dining. We don't think it's involved in the fundamental mechanism movement, but it may be another strategy for turning dining on or off based upon controlling the nucleotide state of AAA3. So these, in conclusion, are the more recent people in the lab whose work I highlighted, you know, again, uh, the heroes of the story are, not the, are never the people you see on this stage. It's, you know, the young scientists who are actually doing in the lab, uh, uh, contributing, obviously, experiments, but also ideas. And that's Gira, uh, Baba, Wei Chun. Uh, again, these two work together just amazingly well as a collaboration. And these two, Rick McKinney and Walter Yoon. And uh, with that, I, I'd like to also thank other people involved in Micromanager, iBiology, and thank you, NIH, for making all this possible. So, as I said, Ron has a taxi at five That's minutes. That's okay. I have four. a good ten minutes. But I have a good ten minutes. We'll take questions, Ron. Yeah. I do want to say that even though he's going to Germany, we will have a reception in the library uh, in his honor. You can enjoy some beverages for me. Thank you for an excellent lecture. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more about your plans for iBiology. Sounds fascinating. Well, uh, thank you for that question, which 
Uh, if I fully answer that, I will never get my plane because <laughs> I'll be talking. Because uh, uh, I think there's so many exciting things for that project that I, you know, I just went to the NIA, uh, NSF yesterday, and I brainstormed for them on two hours on that specific question, and it's been part of our discussion um, at at at, uh, at NIH as well. But you know, I think the. Uh, you know, overall, the core directions I think that are very exciting is, first of all, you know, really creating, filming as many scientists as we can to make a really complete library of subjects, people that, again, you as a scientist, if you're interested in learning about whatever, coral reefs, or you're interested in learning about, you know, insulin receptor, you can have an access from a leader on that topic. Uh, I think, so I think that's one very important uh, 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 reason. Education, I think, is very important. And I, I think the reason also for the, uh, gratifyingly, many people are using this in classroom, assigning it to students and so forth. I think the, the thing that we bring to the table there is, again, what, what I think is so essential is not just scientific facts, but what's missing from a lot of the educational system, I think, is really conveying how people get the facts, actually, that they see in the textbook. And, you know, in reality, that's what excites people about science. And for whatever reason, it's almost our best kept secret. I mean, you almost have to have the secret handshake of getting into the club of scientists to understand how interesting and wonderful and exciting that is. You know, that's why it's so transformative when an undergraduate actually gets into a lab and sees the difference between what is happening in a lab versus, you know, what they're having to understand for the textbook or the exam. So I think, you know, this formula of really getting outstanding scientists to communicate what we're doing at any level, whether it's high school students, graduate students, the general public, is a very, very powerful mechanism for education. and and. I'd like iBiology to be the flagship of that. I, I think other things that are important missions to the NIH, training, reproducibility, ethics, whatever, I, you know, I think those are things that obviously, um, you know, leaders of the field and at the NIH have to really kind of formulate thoughtful plans for how to disseminate that, get the best people involved and you know, everything from how to training a graduate student how to give a talk to what happens in the industry or, I mean, there are a whole huge swaths of the a training issue, too, that, um, again, shouldn't be confined just to UCSF because we have a history of that and we've learned how to do that. But even at UCSF, we need on-demand resources. I mean, what if the postdoc missed the seminar on that, or it was six months ago and they can't remember everything, there needs to be a really excellent uh, community-based resource for doing that. And, you know, I think because iBiology is our project, it's our project, that's, I don't view it as my project. I view this as a, y your project, my project, the project of the scientific community, our profession. Uh, you know, I think it'd be great if this really becomes our project, a place, a really a central place where people can get information, uh, video, media-based, you know, relevant to the life sciences. Um, so, yeah, maybe a short answer, but that's, you know, where I, I see it. And, you know, young people, this is where they're getting information, too. Um, you know, uh, in addition to written formats. Um, I'm sorry, this may be. I didn't plant that question. <laughs> I'm sorry, this may be a very naive question, but I was wondering because in your single molecule assay, you, you saw such a drastic af effect of a modulatory protein on the activity of, of dynein. Could this be used as a way to discover more modulatory proteins? I mean, can you combine things like fractionation biochemistry with a single molecule assay like this and discover more pr modulatory proteins? Uh, absolutely. Well, first of all, we do know of other modulatory proteins like LIS1 and Noodle. These are other things. But, um, and there's been some nice work on them. I would say that we still don't fully understand even the ones that have been described, how they actually work. 
in modulating motility. Um, so, uh, so the answer is yes. I think we need to first under, also understand things that we already know about better, like Dynactin's example. It's been in the literature for many years. Um, but I think there are going to be new factors for sure that regulate uh, dynamic motility that we don't know about. And in combination with biochemistry and single molecule work, I think we can figure out. I mean, you know, a big message I do want to, and this is my feel, but you know, obviously genomics is fantastic. And it's been a game changer. But you know, most of the genome is unknown in terms of what these proteins are and what they do. And, you know, I am a really big believer that uh, unless we figure that out, we're not going to understand biology. Um, because it's the interaction and interplay of all these complicated machines. The DNA is just out there to get the players on the field. And once the players are on the field, they are going to their work. And we need to know how they're going, to, going about their work if you know, we're going to really reach the next generation of biology. I, I, I'm a protein chemist, I suppose, but I, I, I'm a big believer that we're not, every time we find a quick mechanism that's going to solve everything for us without really understanding the depth and beauty and how, how these pieces of biology really work, we're always disappointed. You know, we thought we'd figure things out completely with you know, some things earlier, and we're still left with lots of mystery. So I think that's not the only thing, but I think really fundamental biochemistry is going to be an important part of the game, and there are just huge swaths of proteins that we don't know anything about. Really quick, what do those CTT do, do you think? What? Those C-terminal tails on the uh, yeah. microtubules, what do you think they're doing? Well, well they, uh, they are the one site on tubulin and microtubules that is modulated. So if you look at tubulin overall, uh, from yeast to man, the core part that I showed you is almost identical. If you look uh, human isotypes, I can't remember, there's maybe 15 alpha and betas, where they mostly differ is the sequence of the C-terminal tail. Also, all the post-translational regulation, or virtually all, not quite, but almost all, happens not on 90% of the protein, but on that 10% of the protein that's on the tail. So this really looks like the major mechanism of regulatory, uh, re regulation of tubulin. And so this is an example. I, I, I think there are post-translational modifications on tubulin that are modulating dynamic motility, for example. I, th I think it's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we know where to look. It is these C-terminal tails, and I think there's a lot of regulatory mechanism there that we don't understand. But it is the place that we know gets changed by the genome and by post-translational events. Have you ever checked whether microtubule binding proteins or the addition of cargo affects the velocity of your dynein di dynactin complex? Because it's very fast on your naked microtubules in vitro, but I wonder what would happen if you would have it in a cell where you have like other factors affecting that. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is just to repeat it, you know, what are factors that regulate velocity? Uh, yeah, so I mean, gratifyingly, we're getting velocities from this complex that are very similar, especially when we heat up the stage to 37 degrees, that are pretty similar to transport events in cells. Um, so it means we're getting uh, close. But there are some reports, interestingly, for kinesin motors where people look at motility in vivo that looks faster than it does in the in reconstituted systems. And I think, in general, that's always a great opportunity for looking for new biology. You know, we constantly reconstitute things. Uh, you know, DNA replication was developed through reconstitution. But then you always find things in the reconstitution that are not quite the same as there are in vivo. And then by identifying those, you find additional elements of regulation uh, uh, in the system. So uh, I think there's probably more to do in velocity that in vitro and in vivo that you know, the field hasn't tackled yet. I would say for this thing, we're getting pretty close to in vivo velocities now with this complex. Thank you. Well, let's thank Ron for a spectacular talk. Thank you very much. Thanks.